Yay, we're live. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another thrilling installment of The Isolated Literary Society Presents Jane Austen's Persuasion, where many people are persuaded to do and think many things. Hello, everyone. Welcome to stream today. Hi, Tila. Hi, Michelle. Uh, well, somebody gave me some feedback yesterday after the stream went a little bit long and uh, reminded me that some people might be uh, holding off their dinner until after the stream, which is what I am doing, so I should be more sympathetic. So anyway, um, I'm going to keep it Keep it tight tonight, <laughs> not go over, not be tempted just because I really want to know what happens in the next chapter. So tragically today, Pepper is over sitting on the floor uh, over there. So he, I, we may we may not have any Pepper cameos, at least not in the first half of the video. So <laughs> just wanted to let you guys know, keep you abreast of uh, Pepper's. Oh, well, Michelle, you are very clever to have made your dinner in advance. <laughs> All right, well. <laughs> so uh I mean, that's the sensible thing to do you guys can have dinner uh while you're watching or make dinner while you're watching or listening uh i can't make or eat dinner while i read unfortunately uh you guys would probably not like it if i tried okay so i decided what i was going to do is go back a little bit to uh, Anne's arrival at Uppercross, which is when I should have stopped last night. I just got carried away. So, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, yes, well, um, yesterday we learned about the Crofts, Admiral and Mrs., who are letting, uh, is that the right form of that? <laughs> to let? Something I guess it's more like I think the, you can use it either way. Yeah, because is that does that just mean the person who is who is renting it out or the person who is using it? I don't know. Rent works both ways, but yeah, I feel like I've heard let both ways too. At any rate, Admiral Croft and Mrs. Croft are the people who are going to live at Kellen Hall now, and uh, uh, Elizabeth has uh, taken her dear friend Mrs. Clay off to Bath. And left Anne to go hang out with Mary, uh, their other sister, who's married to the guy who wanted to marry Anne. And she was like, nah, I'm good. Uh, but Anne is going to go hang out with Mary now. So that's where we are. Let's get into it. Uppercross was a moderate-sized village, which a few years back had been completely in the Old English style, containing only two houses superior in appearance to those of the yeomen and laborers, the mansion of the spire with its high walls, great gates, and old trees, substantial and unmodernized, and the compact, tight parsonage enclosed in its own neat garden, with a vine and a pear tree trained round its casements. But upon the marriage of the young squire, it had received the improvement of a farmhouse elevated into a cottage for his residence, and Uppercross Cottage, with its veranda, French windows, and other prettinesses, was quite as likely to catch the traveler's eye as the more consistent and considerable aspect and premises of the great house, about a quarter of a mile farther on. Here Anne had often been staying. She knew the ways of Uppercross as well as those of Kellynch. The two families were so continually meeting, so much in the habit of running in and out of each other's house at all hours, that it was rather a surprise to her to find Mary alone. But being alone, her ra her, mm, but being alone, her being unwell and out of spirits was almost a matter of course. Though better endowed than the elder sister, Mary had not Anne's understanding or temper. Now, what did ed endowed mean in that this time period? Because I know what it means uh, in modern parlance but uh i don't know if it just means like more generally healthier or something not sure uh quite well uh, while well and happy and properly attended to she had great good humor and excellent spirits but any disposition sunk her completely 
She had no resources for solitude and inheriting a considerable share of the Elliot self-importance was very prone to add to every other distress that of fancying herself neglected and ill-used. In person, she was inferior to both sisters and had, even in her bloom, only reached the dignity of being a fine girl. Oh. I remember reading that last to only reach the dignity of being a fine girl. She was now lying on the faded sofa of the pretty little drawing room, the once elegant furniture of which had been gradually growing shabby under the influence of four summers and two children, and on Anne's appearing, greeted her with, So you come at last. I began to think I should never see you. I am so ill, I can hardly speak. I have not seen a creature the whole morning. Yeah, yeah, as Tila observes, pretty much everybody gets dumped on in this book. Yes, basically. Uh, Jane Austen was like, look, I'm old, I'm tired. I mean, not that old, but... Not that old, but she probably felt older than she was. She's probably was. just like, look, I ain't Since got time for none of this shit. I'm sure she was... Sick. Even the Heroes. The Heroes? Even the Heroes. <laughs> I just saw Michelle post, these characters were her Oreos. And I'm not sure in which, in what way that means. Uh, like... I don't like Oreos, so that sounds to me like it's a cookie you eat when there are no other cookies available. <laughs> but I, I assume yeah. Michelle means something different. But anyway. Uh, I assume she was sick by this time, so she probably felt older than she was. Yeah. Also. <laughs> but yeah, even her heroes get dunked on. 30 or 40 something was yeah. older than it is now, <sighs> too. That's so old. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> I am sorry to find you unwell, replied Anne. Oh, <laughs> Michelle says, I mean, good for dunking. <laughs> ah, I'm sorry to find you unwell, replied Anne. You sent me such a good account of yourself on Thursday. Yes, I made the best of it, and I always do. But I was very far from well at the time, and I do not think I ever was so ill in my life as I have been this all this morning. Very unfit to be left alone, I am sure. Suppose I were to be seized of a sudden in some dreadful way and not able to ring the bell. So Lady Russell would not get out. I do not think she has been in this house three times this summer. Oh, so so Lady Russell would not get out. As in out of the carriage. I mis misunderstood that sentence at first. Uh, I do not think she has been in this house three times this summer. Anne said what was proper and inquired after her husband. Oh, Charles is out shooting. I have not seen him since seven o'clock. He would go, though I told him how ill I was. He said he should not stay out long, but he has never come back, and now it is almost one. I assure you, I have not seen a soul this whole long morning. You have had your little boys with you. Yes, as long as I could bear their noise, but they are so unmanageable that they do me more harm than good. Little Charles does not mind a word, I say, and Walter is growing quite as bad. Oh, with such a mother as you, I can't believe it. <laughs> you have no compassion on my nerves. Yeah. Well, you will soon be better now, replied Anne cheerfully. You know I always cure you when I come. How are your neighbors at the great house? I can give you no account of them. I have not seen one of them today, except Mr. Musgrove, who just stopped and spoke through the window, but without getting off his horse. And though I told him how ill I was, not one of them has been near me. Mm, weird. <laughs> it did not happen to suit the Miss Musgroves, I suppose, and they never put themselves out of their way. You will see them yet, perhaps, before the morning is gone. It is early. I never want them, I assure you. They talk and laugh a great deal too much for me. Oh, Anne, I am so very unwell. It was quite unkind of you not to come on Thursday. <clears throat> when she sent a good account of herself? Right, exactly. My dear Mary, recollect what a comfortable account you sent me of yourself. <laughs> You wrote in the cheerfulest manner and said you were perfectly well and in no hurry for me. And that being the case, you must be aware that my wish would be to remain with Lady Russell to the last. And besides what I felt on her account, I have really been so busy, have had so much to do, that I could not very conveniently have left Kellynch sooner. <laughs> Dear me, what can you possibly have had to do? Even Mary, everybody, Anne is so put upon. A great many things, I assure you. More than I can recollect in a moment, but I can tell you some. I have been making a duplicate of the catalogue of my father's books and pictures. I have been several times in the garden with Mackenzie, trying to understand and make him understand which of Elizabeth's plants are for Lady Russell. I swear, gardeners are always Scottish. 
I literally, I was just, <laughs> I just picked up a, an Agatha Christie novel this morning to read while uh, I was having breakfast. Yeah. And yeah, uh, the it's McDonald is yeah. the name of the yeah. of the gardener, and his dialogue is written in a you know a approximation, yeah. extremely of a, broad brogue. Yeah. Tila said, "Sometimes they're Welsh." <laughs> well, <laughs> I I have I would, not. Uh, I, I cannot, would love to encounter a Welsh gardener. Yeah, uh, I I at least cannot recall uh, re reading any books where uh, a gardener had a last name that either had too many uh, consonants in it for its own good, or was hyphenated, and one of the hyphenate names was Jones. And these are the two ways I can tell someone is Welsh. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, what can you have had to do, uh, 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 Mackenzie? Yes. I have had all my own little concerns to arrange, books and music to divide, and all my trunks to repack, from not having understood in time what was intended as to the wagons. And one thing I have had to do, Mary, of a more trying nature, going to almost every house in the parish as a sort of take leave. I was told that they wished it, but all these things took up a great deal of time. Oh, well, and after a moment's pause, but you have never asked me one word about our dinner at the pools yesterday. Did you go then? I have made no inquiries because I concluded you must have been obliged to give up the party. Oh, yes, I went. I was very well yesterday. Nothing at all the matter with me till the, this morning. He just said that on Thursday. You were not. <laughs> Bitch. <laughs> she does not know how to keep a story straight oh, yeah. to save her life. It would have been strange if I'd not gone. I am very glad you were well enough, and I hope you had a pleasant party. Oh, Tila says that apparently the gardener in the secret garden is, uh, is Welsh. Oh. Or at least in the musical version. I didn't remember that. Yeah. That makes sense. Mary, caught in a lie, yep. <laughs> Except not really caught, because no one's ever going to call her on it. Yeah, and she's never going to admit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, nothing remarkable. One always knows beforehand what the dinner will be and who will be there, and it is so very uncomfortable not having a carriage of one's own. Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove took me, and we were so crowded. They are both so very large and take up so much room, and Mr. Musgrove always sits forward. So there was I, crowded into the back seat with Henrietta and Louisa, and I think it very likely that my illness today may be owing to it. Yes, being crowded between two other people in a carriage is, is often the result of an illness that neither of those people have. Yes. It's weird that she refers to her uh, parents-in-law as Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove when she and her husband are also Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove. Uh, yeah, but uh, it's there's there's all sorts of like she's probably Mr. Charles Musgrove. And yeah, Mr. Charles Musgrove yeah. to make the distinction, but yeah. it still feels weird. Yeah, <sighs> a little farther perseverance and patience and forced cheerfulness on Anne's side produced nearly a cure on Mary's. She could soon sit upright on the sofa and began to hope she might be able to leave it by dinner time. <laughs> Then, forgetting to think of it, she was at the other end of the room, beautifying a nosegay. <laughs> she ate her cold meat, and then she was well enough to propose a little walk. <laughs> but, like, forgetting <laughs> to think about her illness. Yes, yeah. I, oh, oh I, I feel well enough to sit upright. Perhaps I may even leave the sofa by dinner. Oh, look, that <laughs> those flowers need attending to. <laughs> Where shall we go, said she when they were ready. I suppose you will not like to call at the great house before they have been to see you. I have not the smallest objection on that account, replied Anne. I should never think of standing on such ceremony with people I know so well as Miss, Mrs. and the Miss Musgroves. No, oh, but they ought to call upon you as soon as possible. They ought to feel what is due to you as my sister. However, we may as well go and sit with them a little while, and when we have got that over, we can enjoy our walk. <laughs> Anne had always thought such a style of intercourse highly imprudent, but she had ceased to endeavor to check it from believing that, though there were though there were on each side continual subjects of offense, neither family could now do without it. To the great house accordingly they went, to sit the full half hour in the old-fashioned square parlor, with a small carpet and shining floor, to which the present daughters of the house were gradually giving the proper air of confusion by a grand pianoforte and a harp, flower stands, and little tables placed in every direction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, could the originals of the portraits against the wainscot, could the gentleman in brown velvet and the ladies in blue satin have seen what was going on, have been conscious of such an overthrow of all order and neatness? The portraits themselves seem to be staring in astonishment. <laughs>
apparently putting like any additional decoration or furniture in a room is a, a, a modern frivolity. Possibly. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Maybe they yeah. are not uh, like they've left the old furniture, but they're adding new furniture and it's just like. What's well, this? Which the present daughters were gradually giving an air of confusion. And then it lists the pianoforte, a harp, flower stands, and little tables placed in every direction. It just seems like they're like, ugh. So much extra furniture. A whole piano forte. How unnecessary. Let's go extra. The Musgroves, like their house, were in a state of alteration, perhaps of improvement. The father and mother were in the old English style, and the young people in the new. Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove were a very good sort of people, friendly and hospitable, not much educated, and not at all elegant. Their children had more modern minds and manners. There, were, there was a numerous family, but the only two grown up, excepting Charles, were Henrietta and Louisa, young ladies of 19 and 20, who had brought from a school at Exeter all the usual stock of accomplishments and were now, like thousands of other young ladies, living to be fashionable, happy, and merry. Their dress had every advantage. Their faces were rather pretty, their spirits extremely good, their manners unembarrassed and pleasant, they were of consequence at home and favorites abroad. Anne always contemplated them as some of the happiest creatures of her acquaintance. But still, saved as we all are by some comfortable feeling of superiority from wishing for the possibility of exchange, she would not have given up her more elegant and cultivated mind for all their enjoyments. And envied them nothing but that seemingly perfect... Uh, and envied them nothing but that seemingly perfect good understanding and agreement together, that good-humored mutual affection, of which she had known so little herself with either of her sisters. My heart. Poor Anne. Yeah. To have two sisters, but totally deprived of, like, any actual, like, sisterly affection. Yeah. Just yeah. Rude. All right. And, Yeah. Furthermore, having those sisters be, like, rude. Yeah, openly like, rude, not just not friendly. Yeah, like, just openly insulting and at least uh, assuming that you're going to yeah. serve them or whatever. They were received with great cordiality. Nothing seemed amiss on the side of the great house family, which was generally, as Anne very well knew, the least to blame. The half hour was chatted away pleasantly enough, and she was not at all surprised at the end of it to have their walking party joined by both the Miss Musgroves at Mary's particular invitation. <laughs> Mary, who just previously was like, oh, I guess we must go talk to them, but we'll, we'll just stay briefly and then we'll go about our walk. And I don't yeah. want to hang out with them and they're awful and they made me sick. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, also, I almost forgot. This is tangentially related. Uh, after the stream last night, Later in the evening, I watched an episode of Hustle, which is mm -hmm. a British show that I am currently watching my way through. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's her name? Who plays Caroline Bingley in the miniseries was in it. Oh, um, it just completely went out of my head. I thought you had a better chance of remembering her name. I totally, I totally know her name. Yeah. And I just. Uh... But yeah, she was quite delightful in this Anna episode. Anna Chancellor. Anna Chancellor. Yes. yes. She was just at the at the height of her like ridiculous pretentiousness. Oh, like, was she the mark in this particular one? Oh, she was indeed. Uh. It's, it's a con man show. Yes. Uh, but yeah, she plays, she's the mark. She's um she's the owner of a modeling agency who uh, like treats her models like garbage. Mm. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure she did well in that. But oh my God. Yeah, she did. Oh, she was so funny. Yeah. Very well done. Very amusing. Uh, as Steve pointed out, uh, makes you wonder how often Jane Austen saw that sort of sister interaction. Well, she did write what she knew. Yeah. <laughs> in, in terms of relationships. So. Well, I mean, probably. but I feel like, um, well, Emma doesn't have any siblings. Uh, she has her sister. Oh, right. She doesn't have any siblings that live with her. That's right. what, I, what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I guess her, her relationship with her sister is. They're fond of each other, but they're not, like, intimates the way, like, Jane and, and Elizabeth are in, in Pride and Prejudice. Yeah. I was just going to point out that we've seen more than one kind of, of sister relationship yes. in her books. Uh, you know, Jane and Elizabeth are very, very close and, and kind of understand each other. Uh, but then you've got uh, uh, Kitty and Lydia and, and Mary and all just in Pride and Prejudice, there's a, a lot of different inter uh, sister interactions going yeah. on. Yeah. Mary yeah. is just kind of tedious, whereas Kitty and Lydia are ridiculous, you know. Yeah. 
Anyway, all right, chapter six. Anne had not wanted this visit to Uppercross. Anne had not wanted this visit to Uppercross to learn that a removal from one set of people to another, though at a distance of only three miles, will often include a total change of conversation, opinion, and idea. That's one of those weird sentences that I'm like, I'm not sure what she's getting at. Means she she had not wanted, meaning she already knew this. This is oh, a thing that she already knew. She, it, it, you would say today, she didn't need this visit to learn this information. Right, exactly. Like, has she had not wanted to it to learn? What does that mean? <laughs> it sounds like she's saying um, that she, she didn't want yeah, the no. visit to learn something. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... It's anyway. Yeah. It's one get of those now. sentences you have to like read the whole thing. Yeah. And hold it in your mind until you get to the last. And then you're like, oh, okay, I get what that means. She had never been staying there before. Also that she, she, she had never been staying there before. Such an awkward, uh, yeah. Uh, conjunct, uh, not conjunction, uh, awkward, awkward sentence structure. Yeah. Uh, by today's standards. She had never been staying there before without being struck by it or without wishing that other Elliots could have her advantage in seeing how unknown or unconsidered there were the affairs which at Kellynch Hall were treated as of such general publicity and pervading interest. Yet with all this experience, she believed she must now submit to feel that another lesson in the art of knowing our own nothingness beyond our own circle was become necessary for her. For certainly coming as she did with a heart full of the subject, which had been completely occupying both houses in Kellynch for many weeks. She had expected rather more curiosity and sympathy than she found in the separate but very similar remark of Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove. So, Miss Anne, Sir Walter and your sister are gone, and what part of Bath do you think they will settle in? And this without, oh, and this without much waiting for an answer, or in the young lady's edition of, I hope we shall be in Bath in the winter. But remember, Papa, if we do go, we must be in a good situation. None of your queen squares for us or in the anxious supplement of Mary of, upon my word, I shall be pretty well off when you are all gone away to be happy at Bath. She could only resolve to avoid such self-delusion in the future and think with heightened gratitude of the extraordinary blessing of having one such truly sympathizing friend as Lady Russell. Mm. It is Anne very deserves better. Yeah, it is very unfortunate for Anne that Lady Russell is her best friend. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a, that is a good point, Tila. Uh, she's saying that uh, sometimes the sentence structures that she writes in a way resemble, I think in the way that they differ from how we would say the same thing today, uh, resemble sort of an AAVE uh, sentence oh. structure. Like she had never been staying there is more, I would argue is more similar to, um, well, I now, now I don't want to try and concoct a similar thing. Right. I think I understand linguistically the point, but now I'm like, oh, I'm going to stop short of trying to actually concoct a similar sentence. It was at sentence. the end of the sentence, though. She had never been staying there. It was No, 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 no. But it's just, it's just an interesting observation. Hmm. Uh, gosh, where did I... Ah, oh, so, truly sympathizing friend is Lady Russell. Yay. The Mr. Musgroves had their own game to guard and to destroy, their own horses, dogs, and newspapers to engage them, and the females were fully occupied in all the other common subjects of housekeeping, neighbors, dress, dancing, and music. She acknowledged it to be very fitting that every little social commonwealth should dictate in its own matters of discourse, and hoped ere long to become a not unworthy member of the one she was now transplanted into. With the prospect of spending at least two months at Uppercross, it was highly incumbent on her to clothe her imagination, her memory, and all her ideas in as much of Uppercross as possible. Yes, uh, as Tila pointed out, humans are weird. The way we communicate is weird too. Also, it's just important to remember that the way that you communicate and what seems like the normal and proper way to structure a sentence according to your time period and education level and so social circle or whatever mm -hmm. and area that you live in and what you know where you were brought up blah 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 tons right. of other things does is not inherently better than the way someone else would construct the same sentence with, oh, yeah. in a different situation like there's just so many people who are like Ugh, speak proper english it's like yeah read a jane austen novel at the time, this was proper English, and good luck 
understanding it if you're the kind of person who responds to anything other than how you what you learned in school is not being proper. Yeah. Well, it's the difference between prescriptive and descriptive grammar, which. <laughs> Yes, indeed. As you've uh, added it, Lady Russell seems to understand that Anne needs a wider acquaintance without realizing she's one of the reasons. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she needs wider acquaintance away from you, Lady Russell. Ah, she all wants right. you to have a certain kind of wider acquaintance. Mm -hmm. She had no dread of these two months. Mary was not so repulsive and unsisterly as Elizabeth. <laughs> Well, didn't take much though, does it? <laughs> Nor so inaccessible to all influence of hers. Neither was there anything among the other com component parts of the cottage inimical to comfort. Mm -hmm. Inimical. I always have a hard time pronouncing inimical. that. I don't know that I'm familiar with that word. Uh, inimical? Does it mean I don't have my phone? Um, I don't think it means you don't have your phone on you. This is. <laughs> this is <laughs> Uh, it has to do with imitation. Oh, yeah. I was wondering if it was like... Uh, like similar. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Or... Uh, yeah. Instead. Interest word. Uh, she was always on friendly terms with her brother-in-law, and in the children, who loved her nearly as well, and respected her a great deal more than their mother, she had an object of interest, amusement, and wholesome exertion. Charles Musgrove was civil and agreeable. In sense and temper, he was undoubtedly superior to his wife, but not of powers or conversation or grace to make the past, as they were connected together, at all a dangerous contemplation. Though at the same time, Anne could believe with Lady Russell that a more equal match might have greatly improved him, and that a woman of real understanding might have given more consequence to his character and more usefulness, rationality, and elegance to his habits and pursuits. As it was, he did nothing with much zeal but sport, and his time was otherwise trifled away without benefit from books or anything else. He had very good spirits, which never seemed much affected by his wife's occasional lowness, bore with her, unreasonable, um, bore with her unreasonableness sometimes to Anne's admiration, and upon the whole, though there was very often a little disagreement in which she had sometimes more share than she wished, being appealed to by both parties. Mm -hmm. They might pass for a happy couple. They might pass. They might. They were always perfectly agreed in the want of more money and the strong inclination for a handsome present from his father. But here, as on most topics, he had the superiority. For while Mary thought it a great shame that such a present was not made, he always contended for his father's having many other uses for his money and a right to spend it as he liked. As to the management of their children, his theory was much better than his wife's, and his practice not so bad. I could manage them very well, if it were not for Mary's interference, was what Anne often heard him say, and had a good deal of faith in. But when listening in turn to Mary's reproach of, Charles spoils the children so that I cannot get them into any order, she never had the smallest temptation to say, very true. <laughs> One of the least disagreeable circumstances of her residence uh, her residence there was her being treated with too much confidence by all parties and being too much in the secret of the complaints of each house. Known to have some influence with her sister, she was continually requested or at least receiving hints to exert it beyond what was practicable. I wish you could persuade Mary not to be always fancying herself ill was Charles' language. Sorry, I thought, I thought that was going to be one of the Miss Musgroves for some reason. I mean, I it wish, could be any of right? them, really. I wish you could persuade Mary not to be always fancying herself ill, was Charles' language. And in an unhappy mood, thus spoke Mary, I do believe if Charles were to see me dying, he would not think there was anything the matter with me. I am sure, Anne, if you would, you might persuade him that I really am very ill, a great deal worse than I ever own. No one knows that is what I not, suffer. not possible, Mary. No one knows what it I suffer. It is not possible that you could not that you could be more sick than you claim to be without it being visibly obvious to everyone around you, like <laughs> that you had a you know that you you know, unable to get out of bed you know with a fever or something like that. Like, but then it's just, I never complain. But then she never complains. They uh, Esty probably <laughs> Esty knows the the um. The version, the adapt adaptation that she uh, let, has seen and likes, um, they handled this really well. There's like a a series of people coming and sitting. It's like 
a shot of Anne sitting in this couch and a series of people like coming in and talking to her just sort of like time lapse. There's like, oh, nice. there's like first there's Charles and Anne and then there's Mary and Anne and then there's like all this like back and forth. And yeah. Nice. <laughs> she's like, <laughs> yes, mm -hmm, definitely. <laughs> oh, yes. I, yeah. I, quite so, quite so. <laughs> yes. Uh, Charles and Mary can't use Anne to settle their marriage disputes. Yeah. Mm. Hey, it's really not uh, not fair, no. honestly, to, uh, for them to uh, ask her. Certainly has not stopped plenty of other people. Hmm, that's the tooth. Mary's declaration was, I hate sending the children to the great house, though their grandmama is always wanting to see them, for she humors and indulges them to such a degree and gives them so much trash and sweet things that they are sure to come back sick and cross for the rest of the day. Maybe they come back cross because they're having to return home to you, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> also, you try and stop a grandmother from giving their, uh, her grandchildren candy. Yeah. Just try. It's true. And Mrs. Musgrove took the first opportunity of being alone with Anne to say, Oh, Miss Anne, I cannot help wishing, Miss, wi wishing Mrs. Charles had a little of your method with those children. They are quite different creatures with you. But to be sure, in general, they are so spoiled. It is a pity you cannot put your sister in the way of managing them. They are as fine, healthy children as ever were seen, poor little dears, without partiality. But Mrs. Charles knows no more how they should be treated. Bless me, how troublesome they are sometimes. I assure you, Miss Anne, it prevents my wishing to see them at our house so often as I otherwise should. I otherwise, uh, I believe Mrs. Charles is not quite pleased with my not inviting them oftener. But you know it is very bad to have children with one. What? Uh, that one is obliged to be checking every moment. Don't do this and don't do that. Or that one can only keep in tolerable order by more cake than is good for them. <clears throat> so she admits. Uh, can you get the blind? Oh, sure. Yeah, the, <laughs> this is... Uh, uh, th I do enjoy that everyone seems to be directly contradicting each other. And several of them seem to be implying, if not outright saying, we wish Charles had married you instead. Yeah. Oh, no, no, that's not. Uh, yeah, that is. Except uh, for Charles. She she ex she acknowledges that his he's not that like focused on the past or yeah, anything. But right. like, all of all of his relations seem to be like this. You would be better in this job. You would be better at this. Yeah. At the job of being our daughter-in-law. Yes. <laughs> Tila uh, said, it's me, Grandmama, Anastasia. <laughs> classic, classic moment from that movie. Uh, all right. She had this communication, moreover, from Mary. Mrs. Musgrove thinks all her servants are so steady that it would be high treason to call it into question, but I am sure, without exaggeration, that her upper housemaid and laundry maid, instead of being in their business, are gadding about the village all day long. I meet them wherever I go, and I declare I never go twice into my nursery without seeing something of them. If Jemima were not the trustiest, steadiest creature in the world, it would be enough to spoil her, for she tells me they are always tempting her to take a walk with them. And on Mrs. Musgrove's side, it was... I make it a rule of never interfering in any of my daughter-in-law's concerns, for I know it would not do, but I shall tell you, Miss Anne, because you may be able to set things to rights, that I have no very good opinion of Mrs. Charles's nursery maid. I hear strange stories of her. She is always upon the gad, and from my own knowledge, I can declare she is such a fine-dressing lady that she is enough to ruin any servants she comes near. Mrs. Charles quite swears by her, I know, but I just give you this hint, that you may be upon the watch, because if you see anything amiss, you need not be afraid of mentioning it. Always upon the gad. Always upon the gad. Ugh. Don't you hate someone who's always upon the gad? Also, don't you just hate it when your servants dress nice? Yeah. Oh, Ugh. my God. Oh, my God. How Such dare she... a bad influence. How dare she look good? She's making all the other servants think that they also could look good. Yeah. Rude. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it was Mary's complaint that Mrs. Musgrove was very apt not to give her the precedence, the precedence that was her due when they dined at the great, great house with other families. And she did not see any reason why she was to be considered so much at home as to lose her place. And, oh, excuse me. And one day when Anne was walking with only the Miss Musgroves, one of them, after talking of rank, people of rank, and jealousy of rank, said... I have no scruple of observing to you how nonsensical some people are about their place because all the world knows how easy and indifferent you are about it. 
and make those hints broadest which were meant for her sister's benefit. <laughs> in all other respects, her visit began and proceeded very well. Her own spirits improved by change of place and subject, by being removed three miles from Kellynch. Mary's ailments lessened by having a constant companion, and their daily intercourse with the other family, since there were neither there was neither superior affection, confidence, nor employment in the cottage to be interrupted by it, was rather an advantage. It was certainly carried nearly as far as possible, for they met every morning and hardly ever spent an evening asunder. But she believed they should not have but she believed they should not have done so well without the sight of Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove's respectable forms in their usual places, or without the talking, laughing, and singing of their daughters. She played a great deal better than either of the Miss Musgroves, but having no voice... <laughs> having no voice? Uh. <laughs> ah, that's it in a nutshell. Oh, uh, people are saying there's, there's buffering issues. Uh-oh. Sorry, I, I, I'm sorry. I saw the spinning wheel uh, comment, and I did not know what that was in reference to. I'm sorry. It, it, it's back. People seem to be saying it's okay. Hmm. Sorry, there were some, there's some messages retracted. I don't know uh, if everything is okay. Uh, Maybe wait a minute. And see yeah, that. I'm just gonna wait a moment. Also, let me know if. Um, oh, you missed a bit. Okay. Um, how was Anne to set all these matters to rights? Have you guys, is that going back too far? Because if you miss, if you just miss the end of the complaints, I'm going to not go back and reread it because honestly, it's just everybody contradicts each other. Yes. <laughs> all right, let's see. <clears throat> How was Anne to set all these matters to rights? She could do little more than listen patiently, soften every grievance, and excuse each to the other give them all hints of the forbearance necessary between such near neighbors, and make those hints broadest which were meant for her sister's benefit. In all other respects, her visit began and proceeded very well. Her own spirits improved by change of place and subject, by being removed three miles from Kellynch. Mary's ailments lessened by having a constant companion and their daily intercourse with the other family, since there was neither superior affection, confidence, nor employment in the cottage to be interrupted by it, was rather an advantage. It was certainly carried nearly as far as possible, for they went every morning and hardly ever spent an evening asunder, but she believed they should not have done so well without the sight of Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove's respectable forms in their usual places, or without the talking, laughing, and singing of their daughters. She played a great deal better than either of the Miss Musgroves, but having no voice, no knowledge of the harp, and no fond parents to sit by and fancy themselves delighted, her performance was little thought of, only out of civility, or to refresh the others, as she was well aware. Yeah, I have no doubt that you have been made well aware of the fact that your talents are not appreciated, Anne. Yeah. She, but having no voice, like... Oh, Sheila said the video just died. That's weird. I'm not seeing any, um, uh -oh. like buffering issues usually I, I see something at the top that says like your video is buffering or connectivity issues or something like that oh okay teal's back okay okay Whew. and dusty says she can still see okay good okay sorry i don't know what's causing these connectivity issues i'll have to restart the browser uh, the browser the router other word with a similar sound well okay teal just had to reload the page okay yeah Good, good to remember. If uh, if it's ever uh, 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 hitching appreciably, a little uh, refresh of the page um, sometimes help if it's just on your end. Yeah. Um, okay. She was well aware. She knew that when she played, she was giving pleasure only to herself. But this was no new sensation. Excepting one short period of her life... She had never, since the age of 14, never since the loss of her dear mother, known the happiness of being listened to or encouraged by any just appreciation or real taste. Oh, I wonder what short period of her life that is referring to. In music, she had, always, she had been always used to feel alone in the world, and Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove's fond partiality for their own daughter's performance and total indifference to any other person's gave her much more pleasure for their sakes than mortification for her own. It's a shame that Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove can't extend yeah. a little more enjoyment for their 
uh, Don Ramla's sister, who they they spend enough time harping on uh, yeah. their issues to her and yeah. expecting her to solve all their problems. They can at least appreciate her music. Seriously. The party at the great house was sometimes increased by other company. The neighborhood was not large, but the Musgroves were visited by everybody and had more dinner parties and more callers, more visitors by invitation and by chance than any other family. They were more completely popular. <laughs> the girls, girls were wild for dancing. <laughs> Such a great... Yeah. I hope not as wild as Kitty and Lydia. Yeah. And the evenings ended occasionally in an unpremeditated little ball. Well, didn't it say they're 19 and 20, yeah. respectively? Yeah. So at least they're older. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. It's in their favor. There was a family of cousins within a walk of Upper Cross, in less affluent circumstances, who depended on the Musgroves for all their pleasures. They would come at any time and help play at anything or dance anywhere. And Anne, very much preferring the office of musician to a more active post, played country dances to them by the hour together. A kindness which always recommended her musical powers to the notice of Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove more than anything else. And Alvin drew this compliment. Well done, Miss Anne. Very well done indeed. Lord bless me. How those little fingers of yours fly about. So passed the first three weeks. Michaelmas came, and now Anne's heart must be in Kellynch again. A beloved home made over to others. All the precious rooms and furniture, groves and prospects, beginning to own other eyes and other limbs. She could not think of much else on the 29th of September, and she had this sympathetic touch in the evening from Mary, who on having occasion to note down the day of the month exclaimed, Dear me, is this not the day the cross were to come to Kellynch? I am glad I did not think of it before. How low it makes me. <laughs> yes, <laughs> deals with Anne. Please don't talk to me. A mood. <laughs> yes. The cross took possession with true naval alertness and were to be visited. Mary deplored the necessity for herself. Nobody knew how much, oh, nobody knew how much she should suffer. Mm -hmm. She should put it off as long as she could. That's one of those weird, it's in quotes, but it's not actually dialogue. Yeah. But was not easy till she had talked Charles into driving her over on an early day and was in a very animated, comfortable state of imaginary agitation when she came back. <laughs> I love that. Phrase. A comfortable state of imaginary agitation. That's pretty good. Anne had very sincerely rejoiced in there being no means of her going. She wished, however, to see the cross, and was glad to be within Oh, and was glad to be within when the visit was returned. They came. The master of the house was not at home, but the two sisters were together, and as it chanced that Mrs. Croft fell to the share of Anne, while the Admiral sat by Mary and made himself very agreeable by his good good humoured notice of her little boys, she was well able to watch for a likeness, and if it failed her in the features, to catch it in the voice, or the turn of sentiment and expression. Oh, I skipped an illustration. Sorry. Was it another mm. uh, illustration of a thing that we... Kind of. Is Charles actually happening? spoils the children, so... Mm. At least it's, it's, I mean, it's characters, right. you know, yeah. from the, from the story, yeah. but it is something that's just sort of referenced as happening, but doesn't actually happen. Yeah. Something is supposed to have happened. But now we have an idea of how old the boys are supposed to be, or at least how old this illustrator thought they were supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it's ever explicitly stated. It's true. <clears throat> Mrs. Croft, though neither tall nor fat, had a squareness, uprightness, and vigor of form. <laughs> Interesting. She's not tall or fat, but she's very square. She sounds like a fine agricultural <laughs> Irish girl. Yeah. <laughs> Which uh, gave importance to her person. She had bright, dark eyes, good teeth, and altogether an agreeable face. Though her reddened and weather-beaten complexion, the consequence of her having been almost as much at sea as her husband, made her seem to have lived some years longer in the world than her real eight and thirty. Sorry, I'm about to turn uh, 8 and 30 in a couple of days. Well, so somehow that just like struck me. It's like, oh, yes, this character is be was being depicted as like, you know, an, an old married woman. Like, yeah. I just, I just, in my head, I was picturing her much older than myself. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I am uh, almost 10 years older than Anne. And Anne is like old for a, an Austin heroine anyway. Yeah. You just keep forgetting how. For a, for a single woman. Well, especially for the time period. Yeah. Um, obviously, things were different then. But yeah. 
just to hear one's own age when you weren't expecting it. It's like, oh, okay, yes. Yeah. Her manners were open, easy, and decided, like one who had no distrust of herself and no doubts of what to do, without any approach of coarseness, however, or any want of good humor. It's so nice to meet a, char a character who seems, like, good. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Anne gave her credit, indeed, for feelings of great consideration towards herself in all that related to Kellynch, and it pleased her, especially as she had satisfied herself in the very first half minute, in the instant even of introduction, that there was not the smallest symptom of any knowledge or suspicion on Mrs. Croft's side to give bias of any sort. She was quite easy on that head, and consequently full of strength and courage, till for a moment electrified by Mrs. Croft's suddenly saying, it was you and not your sister, I find, that my brother had the pleasure of being acquainted with when he was in this country. Anne hoped she had outlived the age of blushing, but the age of emotion she certainly had not. That's a good line. <laughs> oh, yes. Many of us have outlived the age of blushing, but uh, yes, may never outlive the age of emotion. <laughs> Hard mood. Uh, perhaps you may not have heard that he is married, added Mrs. Croft. She could now answer as she ought, and was happy to feel, when Mrs. Croft's next words explained it to be Mr. Wentworth of whom she spoke, that she had said nothing which might not... Sorry. She could now answer as she ought, and was happy to feel, when Mrs. Croft's next words explained it was it to be Mr. Wentworth of whom she spoke, that she had said nothing which might not do for either brother. <laughs> This, uh, you assumes, she just assumes which brother she's talking about. Yeah. And then goes, oh, she's talking about the one I wasn't in love with. Okay, what have I said about him? Okay, it, oh, it's all, it was all super innocuous. <laughs> I'm, I haven't tipped my hand that I was already thinking about Captain Wentworth. Yeah. Whoo! Yeah. Been there. Yeah. She immediately felt how reasonable it was that Mrs. Croft should be thinking and speaking of Edward, not of Frederick, and with shame at her own forgetfulness, applied herself to the knowledge of their former neighbor's present state with proper interest. The rest was all tranquility, till, just as they were moving, she heard the Admiral say to Mary, We are expecting a brother of Mrs. Croft's here soon. I dare say you know him by name. He was cut short by the eager attacks of the little boys, clinging to him like an old friend, declaring he should not go. There we have an illustration of the little boys who are apparently quite fond. <laughs> of, uh, very little yes. in this picture. They too. love, right, yeah. They Well, in this picture and the last one, they look smaller than I was anticipating from yeah. the way they talked about them. But I guess it makes sense. He was, uh, yes, uh, he was cut short by eager attacks of the little boys, clinging to him like an old friend, friend and declaring he should not go. And being too much engrossed by proposals of carrying them away in his coat pocket, etc., to have another moment of finishing or recollecting what he had begun. Anne was left to persuade herself, as well as she could, that the same bro brother must still be in question. She could not, however, reach such a degree of certainty as not to be anxious to hear whether anything had been said on the subject at the other house, where the cross had previously been calling. The folks of Great House were to spend the evening of this day at the cottage, and it being now too late in the year for such visits to be made on foot, the coach was beginning to be listened for when the youngest Miss Musgrove walked in. That she was coming to apologize and that they should have to spend the evening by themselves was the first black idea. And Mary was quite ready to be affronted when Louisa made all right by saying that she only came on foot to leave more room for the harp, which was bringing in the carriage. And I will tell you our reason, she added, and all about it. I am come on to give you notice that Papa and Mamma are out of spirits this evening, especially Mamma. She is thinking so much of poor Richard, and we agreed it would be best to have the harp, for it seems to amuse her more than the pianoforte. I will tell you why she is out of spirits. When the Crofts called this morning, they called here afterwards, did they not? They happened to say that her brother, Captain Wentworth, is just returned to England, or paid off or something, and is coming to see them almost directly. And most unluckily, it came into Mama's head when they were gone that Wentworth, or something very like him, was the name of poor Richard's captain at one time. I do not know when or where, but a great while before he died, poor fellow. Upon looking over his letters and things, she found it was so, and is perfectly sure that this must be the very man, and her head is quite full of it, and of poor Richard. So we must be all be as merry as we can, that she may not be dwelling upon such gloomy things. That's kind of adorable. 
Yeah. At first, I thought this was a sign of them being a little frivolous, like bringing the the harp with them. Yeah. Wait, wait. It's not like they don't have a way to make music. They have a piano forte, apparently. Right, but yeah. like, she's like, oh, dude, this is better. But it's like that does seem kind of yeah, understandable. Yeah. Also, at least Anne now has the information confirmed, although it's not yeah. perhaps the information that she wanted, or is it? I always forget that. Uh, yes, or is it? I always mm-hmm. forget that part that the oh. the Musgroves had a son. Who was yeah i didn't remember that it, under the he the captain wentworth was his captain at some point i don't know that that has been mentioned that they even had a son that died until just now this might yeah. be the introduction of that information i'm pretty sure that you haven't. guys i'm sorry but like pepper is being so cute right now i just his I'm eyes sorry. are opening just a little bit can you guys i i can't tell where i'm has, has it has uh it yeah it's yeah it's a little bit more there you go. See, there he is. Look how precious. <laughs> that little little uh, crocheted heart has catnip in it. It was made by um, my friend Kelsey. Oh. You can see she, she also makes ones that look... Oh, my gosh. She just did such a good stretch, you guys. I'm so sorry. Oh. Oh, it would have been so good. If only I just kept the... My, my hand was starting to cramp, holding the laptop at a weird angle. He just made such a good stretch. Oh, anyway, Kelsey also makes cat toys, little crocheted cat toys that look like uh, sushi rolls and like half an avocado and uh, little pumpkins and all kinds of really cute stuff. Anyway, SD, if you happen to have her website handy, you can post the link in the chat. Anyway, where were we? I just got distracted. My cat, I'm just looking like right past the camera and there he is being adorable. Oh, oh yeah, she makes donut ones as well. They're super adorable. Is and Aaron, Aaron's not here today. Uh, no, he does not seem to be in the in the chat today. Uh, that's my brother Aaron's partner, Kelsey. Um, yeah, I think it's brightersides.com, possibly. Something like that mm-hmm. is her website. But anyway, she sells all kinds of really cute stuff. And a portion of the of every sale goes to uh, some sort of animal welf- welfare. Probably the shelter. She works for an animal shelter, so probably that one. Anyway. anyway, oh my gosh, so many emotions. Captain Wentworth. Yes. Coming. The real circumstance of this pathetic piece of family history was that the Musgroves had the ill fortune of a very troublesome, hopeless son, and the good fortune to lose him before he reached his 20th year, that he had been sent to sea because he was stupid and unmanageable on shore. Oh, wow, I was expecting wow. this. Wow. That he had been very little cared for at any time by his family, though quite as much as he deserved seldom heard of and scarcely at all regretted when the intelligence of his death abroad has worked its way to Uppercross two years before. Wow. Oh, thank you for posting the link. Wow. Yeah. That was, that wasn't even dunk. That was just, she just, she just in- insulted him. Yeah. I feel like it has to be a little like subtler to be considered a dunk. Really? Just saying someone's an asshole is like, Oh, it's not like, Oh, you just got dunked on. No, it just said you're an asshole. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it is, very, it is somehow, very factual. But, wow. And it's the way she's saying it. I was surprised that she said this pathetic piece of family history. I was like, maybe she means pathetic in a different way, but no, I'm not so sure. That was when I, well, I think it might just be referring to, sorry, I keep, um, it might just mean, like, pathos in DC. Yeah, that's what I thought. I was yeah. like, oh, she must just mean it's, it, it, you know, it makes one sympathetic yeah. to them. But then it's, it's then she's so harsh troublesome and hopeless they had the good fortune to lose him he is stupid and unmanageable and had been very little cared for at the time like wow this is harsh yeah he had in fact though his sisters were now doing all they could for him by calling him poor richard been nothing better than a thick-headed unfeeling unprofitable dick musgrove who had never done anything to entitle himself to more than the abbreviation of his name living or dead Okay, I know that Dick was not an insult at this time period because that's that's one of those things that's more recent than you think. Yeah. Uh, but to, to refer to someone named Richard as Dick and say that he'd never entitled himself to anything more than the abbreviation of his name actually seems like... It kind of seems like it's, it's at least some kind of insult. Well, it seems like she's just insulting him to be like, he doesn't even deserve to be called Richard. He should only be called Dick, the oh. very informal version of his name. That that could be. Yeah, Teal says, I don't think he exists anymore. Austin just obliterated him. He had been several years at sea. 
and had, in the course of those removals to which all midshipmen are liable, and especially such midshipmen as every captain wishes to get rid of, had been six months on board Captain Frederick Wentworth's frigate, the Laconia, and from the Laconia he had, under the influence of his captain, written the only two letters which his father and mother had ever received from him during the whole of his absence. That is to say, the only two disinterested letters. All the rest had been mere applications for money. <laughs> it <He> certainly was. <laughs> in each letter he had spoken well of his captain, but yet, so little were they in the habit of attending to such matters, so unobservant and incurious were they as to the names of men or ships, that it had made scarcely an impression at the time, and that Mrs. Musgrove should have been suddenly struck this very day with the recollection of the name of Wentworth as connected with her son, seemed one of those extraordinary bursts of mind which do sometimes occur. It's like Austin's trying to justify, like, or or not justify, because she doesn't have to justify. She just could have said, no, she just remembered because Dick used to write about him all the time. Instead, she's like, wow, how amazing that she happened to remember. Because otherwise, Anne could have subtly asked, oh, do you know which brother? And they could have been like, oh, I don't know. Is there more than one brother? No, oh, I don't know. They just, said, they just said her brother. I have no idea. Yeah. But instead, it's like, oh, it was like so significant that she remembered absolutely. Yeah. She had gone to her letters and found it was all she supposed. And the reperusal of these letters after so long an interval, her poor son gone forever, and all the strengths of his faults forgotten, had affected her spirits exceedingly and thrown her into greater grief for him than she had known on first hearing of his death. Wow. That's harsh. I can actually kind of see with like, if someone has been like such a source of stress for you. That's true. And then they die. You might kind of have mixed feelings, yeah. but with the passage of time, it's true. You might come to be more sad that he just that he never had a chance to improve himself, yeah. or not a chance. He probably had plenty of chances, but that he well, you never know if the person lived longer, maybe they would have you know turned yeah. around or whatever. But now we'll never know. Like this, what the possible loss of possibility? I can see kind of hitting her differently now. Yeah. <sighs> Mr. Musgrove was, in a lesser degree, affected likewise, and when they reached the cottage, they were evidently in want first of being listened to anew on this subject, and afterwards of all the relief which cheerful companions could give. Dude, Anne needs to be making uh, psychiatrist wages. Yeah. <laughs> like. Yep. To hear them talking so much of Captain Wentworth, repeating his name so often, puzzling over past years, and at last ascertaining that it might, that it probably would, Turned out to be the very same Captain Wentworth whom they recollected meeting once or twice after their coming back from Clifton was a, a very fine young man, but they could not say whether it was seven or eight years ago was a new sort of trial for Anne's nerves. And we all know Anne's nerves have seen many, many trials. Yes. She found, however, that it was one to which she must inure herself. Since he actually was expected in the country, she must teach herself to be insensible on such points. And not only did it appear that he was expected, and speedily, but the Musgroves, in their warm gratitude for the kindness she had, he had shown poor Dick, and very high respect for his character, stamped as it was by poor Dick's having been six months under his care, and mentioning him in strong, though not perfectly well-spelt praise, as a fine, dashing fellow. Oh, this is referring to his letter. A fine, dashing fellow, with one L, only too particular, uh, with an E, about the schoolmaster were bent on introducing themselves and seeking his acquaintance as soon as they could hear of his arrival. The resolution of doing so helped to form the comfort of their evening. And that is the perfect place to end for the day. We're just coming up on an hour and that's the end of a chapter. If only it always worked out that way. <laughs> <clears throat> I was keeping an eye on time. But luckily with the, the number of pages we had was just perfect, just marvelous. Anyway. Oh my gosh, you guys, so many feelings. Yes. It is nice for, for Anne to like uh, have finally met someone like moderately sensible. I mean, we didn't get to talk to Mrs. Croft very long. Yeah. But she seemed at least so far to be like not ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, and also not like uh, secretly manipulative like Lady Russell is. Yeah. Yeah. So, cool. <laughs> or snobby like Lady Russell. Right. Yeah. So that's exciting. Uh, uh, also, o OMG, Captain Wentworth. <laughs> oh, I'm Jay. Anyway, um, 
so many feelings that Anne has to keep inside. I know. Like, how oh, has she not Anne. exploded? Right? Like, just no wonder she's so, like, kind of quiet and, like, yeah, weird. She's like, like bot- she's trying not to burst with everything. Yeah. Well, it's also just so many people are just, she's so put upon. Yeah. You know, just everyone, if, if they're not, knows. which will, but because she was raised by people who didn't care about yeah, her. Yeah, no, not, I mean, I'm, care not, about her, I'm but, not saying it's not natural, yeah. but like, she yeah. doesn't, she's trained herself to not, yeah. to think that she doesn't matter because everybody else. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, like, she has she been trained by the people around her not to anybody. trust her own importance or to to value her own time or anything like that she yeah. just believes her job is just to soothe other people and yes you know just be quiet and and unobtrusive and be their, their Anne. mental health specialist yes tila i too would like to wrap Anne in a blanket <laughs> so on that note uh we will wrap up for the day i will be back tomorrow 6 30 pacific for more persuasion. And then remember, I'm taking Friday off to watch uh, an online music festival. Uh, and that is my birthday. Woo! Woo-hoo. I should make a cake or something. <laughs> uh, and um, that I will be back on Monday. And I made uh, a number of uh, video pages in the playlist. So you can go to the playlist uh, if you want to do like hit reminder, uh, set reminder thing so that you can uh be reminded of the videos but yeah uh oh also on friday also also on friday don't forget thank you rusty for reminding me rovers uh the musical is uh airing um i can't remember what time but um damn aaron's not here to post the link um it's the annex theater uh it's their youtube page so if you search the annex theater on YouTube, hopefully. Ah, thank you, Michelle. Seven thirty Pacific, apparently. Um, but yeah, if you look Rovers the musical or Annex Theater on YouTube, you'll probably find it. Uh, it's a new musical, um, new in the. It, it premiered two years ago in Seattle, um, and my brother did the music for it, and they uh, recorded video of it, and they are doing like they are live streaming the pre-recorded video this Friday, and then there'll be a live talk back with some of the cast and crew afterwards. Uh, it's a delightful musical about uh, Mars rovers uh, being at uh, summer camp. It's adorable and poignant. And if you have space feelings, it's <laughs> absolutely for you. So, uh, yeah, I uh, recommend checking that out on Friday. And then um, thank you, SD, for posting the link. Excellent. Uh, and then also... Um, uh, check out the Subdued String Band Jamboree on sa- uh, Saturday. I'll be watching some of that. It's a cool um, music festival in Bellingham. If you want some cool music playing throughout your day on Saturday, you do that. Uh, uh, it's a it's a great festival. This was their twentieth uh, annual festival, so it's a bit it's a bit sad that the the twentieth such a landmark year had to be uh, only online. But um, yeah, it's going to be great. And then I will see you guys back here on Monday for more persuasion. So on that note, good night.